Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hopefully you guys can hear me okay. We can't see you. Hello? We can't see you. <laughs> yeah, I haven't I haven't shared my video. I'm just I'm really trying out this because I have to log in as uh I have to log in as Apostle Tim just so that I could possibly share my screen. So um I remember okay. the, the the last semester we were unable to share our screen due to some technical uh, difficulties and also uh, we are here doing evangelism today so I'm in the children's classroom which maybe I might decide to continue to use this classroom as our for our teaching um, so but if you hear noise in the background there are people still cleaning the sanctuary as well so you may hear like vacuum cleaning but um, do excuse that noise, but this is the hour that they come in to clean normally, that we clean normally, so. Okay. Yeah, so let's just wait a moment and see if anyone else will join. Um, I wanted to ask something though, if anyone is able to uh, take attendance for us, that means you have to be here often. So if you're going to volunteer for this, um, why am I saying this? so that when um, that time comes later on at the end and someone needs points or here or there, then we may add, um, add points to those that actually join the class all the time. Yes, I just saw your comment. I don't know why you asked that, but we are doing uh, customs and manners. Why, why did you say that? We are. I just want to get, um, I thought we are doing manners and customs, yeah. Were you saying because of the login or because you see Apostle Tim's name? Because we are. The only reason for, oh, okay. Yeah, the only reason for logging in this way is because he was unable to figure out why I can't share anything. Um, like sharing the screen. And I was like, we don't want to do that again this semester where I can't share nothing. And I have to keep sending. I mean, I don't mind sending the slides, but if we can share anything, then and he's trying to give me other type of access. I believe the same thing happened to Pastor Chris yesterday, um, which thing happened to him last semester. So we can see that that was a common issue that was going on. So this is why we asked for him to give us the password so we could just log in as well. Um, since he's the admin, uh, we we'll just use it to log in to Zoom. So we can also record and have the, the trainings available. So uh, before we go forward anyways, before we pray, uh, so who's gonna volunteer to take um, attendance for us like again you have to at least try to be there all the time so it could be one or two um, I could do it but sometimes you get distracted with like reading things and making sure I don't forget to do it but um, someone that that would show up to class often and would take this attendance and then we'll be able to uh, keep the record for Anytime someone needs extra points. Um, but we're going to start today with, of course, our syllabus, but we are going to go into some of our uh, 
lecture today, uh, hopefully to finish the, the very first chapter. I mean, in terms of pages, it's not that long at all. It's actually 10 before you move from one chapter to the next, which is uh, starting from num uh, page 20, I believe, in our text. So we should be able to cover the part that talks specifically about, uh, about clothing. Uh, this is the book. I've had questions about the new edition, as long as it's the same author um, as you have in our books here, in our syllabus here, as long as you have Ralph Gore, um, whether it's new edition, I believe that it's, just, it's maybe more things that's added. It shouldn't be something that's taken out unless they made some correction, but this is the actual book that we are using. Mind you, there are other manners and custom book that's not by the same author. So you just want to make sure it's by this author, Graf Gore. So uh, a little, just, we're just going to have a brief summary of the syllabus. But before we go into that, let me just say what a prayer. Father, we thank you. We bless your name for this hour. Lord, we ask, oh Lord, that you will come and teach us, open our ears to receive what you have for us in the name of Jesus Christ. What you have prepared, we will not miss in the mighty name of Jesus. Help us to learn, help us to receive, help us to receive, help us to retain in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen, amen, amen. Again, sorry about that. There's so many people here as well. Um, partly evangelizing um this is why we all came here today first so there are some people that went for evangelizing let me close let me lock the door so no one will open it and come in thank you so in this course mainly manners and customs of the bible i actually uh love this uh this teaching so the course it is intended to explore customs and manner of the bible time in the book uh it serves as the quickest and easiest and most enjoyable way to understand the people and the culture of the bible so like you and I right now, we have a culture. If someone wants to understand our culture, they want to go to our roots. So this gives us kind of like a glimpse into the life of the biblical people and some of the ways that we are able to understand the text as it is written. Some is very important that we know the culture in order to understand the, 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 the human author. The divine author, of course, give inspirations. In order to understand the divine, the divine author, we have to see what the perspective of the, the, the human author that's been given the word. So in order to understand how their life influenced what they wrote, we must understand where they're from, their culture, their upbringing. Sometimes this book exposes us to that. And when we read some things that we, we don't understand, we may get better understanding as to why it's written this, the way that it is written. And sometimes also um, there are some things that seem controversial, like is this particularly to us or was it written to the Jews at a specific time? I mean, in, in this day and age, I mean, it's a choice of fashion, but if you decide that you want to go out and wearing veil on your head and all that, wherever you go, hmm, it's a choice. But at the time, they wore headgears. They wore all the covering that they wore also because of where they live. They have to deal with, with dust that blows wherever you go. This is why they often wash their feet because there are so much sand that they have to walk through. So this explained them having to wear things that cover their face, their head, and things like that. But you have the choice to do it now. If you really love their culture, you say that's what you want to do. Yeah, but you don't live in the desert unless you live in the desert and you want to do that. And you even see some of us, if you've traveled down there to desert areas or the anywhere biblical area, even if you go to Egypt, you ride in Carmel, some of them, you see, you put on the, the scarf on your head and things like that is because of the desert and to prevent the dust from flying and hitting you and running all over your face, especially women. 
in the case that you do your hair and all that, you definitely don't want sand and all that going into the hair that you prepare just to go on vacation. So you might want to observe their culture for that particular moment. So that's what we will have the opportunity to do in this class. Um, so of course we know the class is online. You don't need to talk about that part. Uh, the objective of course is to demonstrate an appreciation of the location and the role of uh, territories and political entities which appear in biblical narrative. Discuss how knowledge of ancient lifestyle and points of view can enable one to elucidate passage objectively rather than subjectively. He helps us to understand the passage, sometimes the intent intent meaning see when something is written and it's like if something happened and it's contemporaneous like it happened right there in that moment what it means may be different for what it would mean when the circumstances is different this is why it helps us to know the customs and manner of the time where the scripture is specifically written so we can know how to apply it. When it comes to application, we must understand customs and manners. When it comes to knowing the mind of the human author, we must understand the culture and the manners because it shapes how you are brought up, shapes your perspective, and it will shape how you write, how you tell a story. All that is influenced by how we were brought up. Uh, also to recognize how major biblical frameworks such as the Feast of Israel and the system of God's covenant allow logical clarification of scriptural paradoxes. There are so many things that we'll get to understand by going to this class one at a time. Again, I already mentioned the, uh, the textbook. So um, fully, we don't need to say that again. Attendance, again, we know the rule about attendance and missing classes. We are very flexible. We just want to make sure that you are able to grasp what you need to grasp. Um, there is a reason that I said the class, um, the reading will be discussed in class. There's something I want to do to make sure people actually attend classes. That way you get the reading. And if, since the class has started, um, unless someone just missed it, if you are asking that question in the chat, in the WhatsApp, if I know you are in class, then I may message it to you directly. But for someone that's not in class, I will leave it to them to go and watch the video, then get the information because there is no way of us knowing that you actually went through the video, like by yourself or you went back and watched it. So some may just, Leave, leave one class and not join it and then don't don't watch the video and join the other day and then just keep going now i know the assignment that i said i i only put for reflection a midterm and a final exam that is subject to change yeah i can go one day we're gonna have quiz but whatever it is it'll be four actual assignment whatever the case may be maybe it will eventually become one quiz and three reflection or two quiz or reflections but i just put reflection there now um because this I, I feel like this is something that you have to do a lot of like descriptions where we want to compare and contrast uh, maybe a particular customs if it's related to something that you've seen in your family or in this generation. How is that particular custom and manner seen now? How has it changed? Has it stopped? Because custom and manner is a sense of traditions. Some traditions are still ongoing. Some tradition people have stopped. So it's more of something that we need to do writing to make sure we understand it rather than just multiple choice that said, oh, the custom and manners of these people is A, B, C, and D. So it's more interactive to try to write about it. But the midterm and final definitely would be um, multiple choice of assessment of are you paying attention to the things that we've been talking about in class or not? That's what that would be about. So um, that's it for the syllabus. Before we move on to, to the slides for the day, at this time we will cover chapter one. Um, so is there anyone with any question at this moment? Feel free to ask, feel free to chime in. And we will be asking questions. Um, if there's any questions that I have, 
So I hope that someone will um, actually contribute. So manners and customs of Bible times. So the bitter introductions, although the Bible is ad adapted to all nations, it is mainly, is this, it, in its many respects, an oriental book. It represents the mode of thoughts and the peculiar customs of a people who in their habits widely differ from us. Widely differ from us. This is why it is not easily said that, oh, that particular scripture is talking about me. You need to find out how it relates to you. Is it like, you know, a lot of things are become spiritually inherited, no more like the physical aspect because you're like, okay, like for example, say Abraham's blessings are mine. Well, we are not physically Abraham's descendant, which we all understand, but spiritually we can claim that because we are brought in spiritually, we are adopted as children. So we can also say that we have claim to that blessing. But if you're being frank, in a sense, we don't have entitlement to that in the physical aspect. Yeah, someone that don't know the Lord, someone that's not been adopted into the kingdom cannot claim that. So the Oriental customs of today are mainly the same as those of ancient times. It is said by a recent writer that the classical world has passed away. We must reproduce it if we wish to see it as it was. So, and I think there's a comment. I am not seeing the slide. Okay, is anyone else not seeing the slide? Because he says I'm sharing. Please comment so I know. No slide. You can't see the slide either? Oh, strange. No. Okay. Let me let me try again. Let me try again. How about now? No, still no. nothing. No. no, you might have to stop sharing and go back in and, and then do it again. Yeah. It. yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me let me do it again. I think it should work now, maybe. Yep. Here we go. Yeah. Yeah. We're just happy to be able to have this at least. I'm so excited about that. So while this facts must be remembered, it is in the interpretation of some New Testament passages, it is nevertheless true that mainly ancient customs still exist in their primitive integrity. The knowledge of biblical custom is essential to a right understanding of scripture passages. It helps us to see the modes of life of patriarchal times. So you, you can see as we're building up to the main purpose of us actually um, studying or being part of this class. Okay. Okay. Now it's like he refused to go to the next page. All right. So today as Christians, we are faced with problem of under identifying meanings when it comes to understanding the Bible. Again, this helps very well simply because God's word came in particular places at a particular time period and to a particular people. So there are some things that are very, very, very specific to a type of people that were specific at a particular time, at a particular moment, and because it was necessary at that time. Like, for example, the way God dealt with his people in the scripture, the way he dealt with them when they have sinned and allowed them to be carried away into exile, he's not dealing with us that way because we are living in a, another time a particular time, a dispensation of grace. 
So there were different dispensations, the things that were going on at that time, the way God was dealing with different people was different at every moment, every time. So we must be able to understand the customs, the manners at that time to understand, oh, if this is specifically for me, or is just something I'm supposed to learn about the way God dealt or dealt with his people. So by standing in the people's shoes, those, those are the Jews or, or, or the biblical times, people of the biblical times, we can understand what God was saying to them, as well as understand the language in which the revelation came to them by, by meaning. Learning the manners and customs of biblical times helps us to place ourselves in the context of the Bible era in order to get a better understanding of their lifestyle. So researching Bible custom is fascinating, this me, but more than feeding curiosity, it helps us to understand the scripture and their context more concisely. Jesus often used the culture and customs of the day to use as illustration in his message, which is what it does. When he's talking about parables, he looks for something that they understand. He looks for something that they are used to. So it can use to explain to them, which makes us have to understand exactly what's going on. So the Old Testament is full of, of course, intriguing customs as well. It's not just the Old Testament, of course, you have in the New Testament, but there's some things that are customs. When we talk about them, we will get to get a better understanding. So some interesting facts. So over many centuries, Jews and the early Christians as well borrowed fashion from all the people around them. This is a prerequisite. It's just walking us through uh, the chapter for today, which is actually clothing, clothing, their, their style, their dressing and things like that. There were many influences because they had been exiled in Egypt, Babylonia, they were ruled by Greeks and Romans. They even live in land which naturally crossroads between major cultures of the ancient world. And besides that, them also being exposing themselves uh, to different, um, I guess, uh, intermarrying, even when God says don't do that, this still happens. And of course, it gave them different type of cultures. So you have to know that that would influence their manners. Whatever you are around, eventually it rubs off on you. Just like the way I'm talking about bad company, bad company. So it, they were exposed to, to the style of dress of the Syrian, the Canaanite, the Assyrian, the Babylonian, the Greeks, and the Romans. So there is something that is different about the clothing in those days. You could not, of course, like normally go to shop and buy those clothes. Like, it was more like you have to make it. You have to make clothes. It, it, it's even like a luxury, even for those that don't have. Like the you have the haves and you have nots, but they have to make the clothes for you. And they based on, I guess, your social economic status. It depends on the way your your clothes may look. But we go into the clothes one at a time. Um, linen was uh, often favored, but making linen out of flax uh, is, is, a, is like a strenuous process, but that's what they usually do. The first, uh, the first, the outer bark of the stem is removed and after it's rubbed and it, the fiber is separated. That's like the process of actually trying to make clothes in this day. Not like when we are right now, we don't even know how our clothes is made, but we just wear, we just wear, I mean, they can say curtain is in this, but we just go to the store and we can grab it off the rack. But back then, you, when, you, when we all see the process of like making a tunic or things like that, you know, they have to be more value to the clothes that you had then. And another thing when we get to talk about it, they don't often, especially those that are not well off, they don't have more than one. They don't have more than one. They wear it in the day, they sleep in the same thing. But the ones with the social economic status with the rich one, they are able to have multicolored different materials, um, things that are embroidery, embroidered and things like that. So, uh, so the wardrobe of a person living in biblical era was considered basic uh, 
basic. Um, it consists of a loincloth. Uh, that that was the one that's one beneath the uh, the tunic, and there was some form of headgear. We'll talk about those two. Um, for the most part, clothing were not fashioned because there were a slight variation in patterns, um, the colors, materials, and style during this time. So it, it's it's not like how nowadays there's so many name brands. I mean, back then <laughs> there's no name brand. It's either probably the I, I'm speculating, probably the brand would be. The, it just identify you as rich or not. That's it. Like you can see it clearly. You can see it clearly now. Even now, you can't have, have what really, really, really rich people or rich person is wearing. You can also find it the same thing in another store that looks like exactly the same thing. You can also put it on. But there, there's not like a choice of this is this, this name brand, that name brand have plethora of name brand to pick from. No, no, you're sewing those clothes. So they have to invest and, and put money aside to, to make sure they can have a garment sleep. When worn undergarment was either in the form of a loin cloth or was a small waist slip. So if, if you if you were reading the book like the images are there, just why I didn't put any images, um, you know, and, and when they're talking about the men's costume, you can see the old, the old overall, everything that the man be wearing. For those that don't have the book yet, um, yeah, you still get it. Even if you're not using it just for the class, it's a good book to have um, just to be able to study and, and prep yourself for like, you know, anything, related to studying and understanding the Bible itself. So um, the inner garment, the men and women, they often wear an inner garment or a, a shirt next to their skin that is called a turnic, a turnic, turnic. Uh, usually this was without sleeves and reached down to the knees or sometimes all the way to the ankle. So that we will see a distinguish between the one for the male and the one for the female. And they pref it, it is of custom that the woman will wear one that is longer, but it's not restricted that the man could not. So uh, for the man, it's so that you can be able to walk, do your work in the field. For the women, it's so that they won't expose themselves because mainly this is not like a pant. It's more like the overall, which is like, like a, if I can call it like a long maxi dress that you just throw a a belt on or something like that, like a just like an old long gown that is just long, and mainly they are using what we may call this flax when they make this tunic or these things. They start basically with uh, what looks like a sack, and all you do is cut the head off. And, and, and the, the arm, um, I don't usually do Halloween thing, but I'm pretty sure most of us have seen what they call the scarecrow or whatever it is they hang. You know, whatever they used to, that, that material they used to make the outfit, just picture that being like the early days, what they were wearing, just cutting a, a, a neck out of it and then cutting an arm out of it and making that something that they were. So the wealthy people will wear tunics which had sleeves and which reached to their ankle. So you imagine someone that have not, is not really worried about paying for something that's long because they can't afford it. It's more like I have something to wear and this is all I'm buying just to cover me up and know that I'm dressed whenever I go out. So usually though, the Jews are in, the days of our Lord Jesus Christ at least um, had one, one change of clothes. We're talking about now, let's say we're moving into the New Testament. A man would be considered to be poor to have only one garment. So we add it in the book of Luke chapter three, verse 11. Let me say, he answered and said to them, he who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, 
let him do likewise. So it was a norm for someone that have at least, uh, that's doing okay to themselves, we have at least one extra tunic with them that they could always share with other people that may be in need. Among the poorer people, the tunic was often the only clothing worn in warm weather because that's the hey, uh, that's the one closer to the skin. Um, the wealthier people might wear the tunic along, alone inside the home, inside their houses, but they would not wear it without the outer garment outside the house. So in, in, in the Bible term, the word naked is sometimes used of men who only have their tunic on. So when they're considered naked, it's like when you look at someone having an underwear, the tunic is like a, your underwear. It's like the undergarment, the inner garment, whatever it is someone is wearing under before you actually wear more layers on it. That's what the tunic represents. Now, when we look at the book of John chapter uh, 21, verse 7, the disciples um, whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. To be dressed in such a scanty manner was thought as nakedness. So it, it is what you wear in the inside of the house, not necessarily outside. That is their custom. That is your undergarment. That is your underwear. Whatever way we spin it in this day and age, that's like someone wearing tank top and a boxer. That is your tunic back then. That is according to their customs and manner that person is practically naked. That person is practically naked. So when we're talking about tunic, I was giving an example here. This is basically how it will start. Now, depending on the length, that is not my Jesus. That's just a picture, okay? Um, I don't even know who this person is, but I just put the picture from online. So um, it, it, it starts with this sack and then it's cut out. And then the arms are cut on each side and it's just worn. So it's either long to the knees for men for the most part or to the, to, to the ankle. So I have a description here. So specifically the tunic was the essential garment. You still wear it under, you need it before you can just put on the, the everything else without having it like so. I mean, a lot of people wear tank tops, you know, underwear, everything you wear before you wear your clothes. So it's, it, it is essential. In many respects, the tunic was like a sack. Usually a V-shaped opening was cut for the head and the slit was made um, in the two corners for the arm. Traditionally, a new tunic was sold without the V-shaped opening as evidence that the clothing was new. So they wouldn't cut it. It's not like how we can go somewhere and buy a shirt that's already made for you. You can even find the size, like fitted. Like uh, you say, oh, my size is this and this. They already know. They just sell you the tunic. You have to go and cut it off by yourself. The tunic was identical for men and women. And the main difference is that for men, it's sometimes at knee length. And for women, at, at ankle length, rather. To avoid, this is it, part of their uh, their custom is to avoid tempting people due to the way one is dressed, especially for, against sexual sin. Um, so I'm putting here the book of Deuteronomy 22, verse 5, as it uh, applies to biblical men. So I want us to discuss that for a moment. So, but I want us to read this first. So the woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. Discussion right there. How does this apply today? I need us to, to chime in. Um, I know there's some people 
They still believe there's some article of clothing that women shouldn't wear, blase, blase. Um, so let's talk about it because that's why we are here in class. Um, let's talk about how does this particular point still apply today? I'll be looking as well if anyone type in the chat. So please, I'll prefer you unmute yourself and just talk. Um, yes, man of God. Uh, this is Sister Desreen. How are you? I'm very well. How are you, Sister Desreen? Oh, I'm fine. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you too. Yes, I think, you know, I've heard pastors say women shouldn't wear pants. Mm. And I never agree with that. Um, mm. Because the pants that women are wearing are made for women. Mm. And the pants men are wearing are made for men. And they're completely different. Right as far as the buttons and everything like that. Right. I think what the Bible passage is talking about is, for example, like today, you know, you have men who say they're drag queens. So mm. they, they put on a dress and makeup and wigs and they're wearing a woman's dress. That dress right. was made for women. Right. You know, it's not men's clothes. And, um, you know, when pastors always say, you know, um, women shouldn't wear pants. I remind them that in biblical times, men weren't wearing pants mm -hmm. because they were wearing like I call you know like a. Mask. They were wearing skirts. They yeah. were wearing skirts. Exactly. There, <laughs> there is no other way to say it. It's, yes. I just call it a maxi dress. Yes. That's what they were wearing. Look, yes. look would you look at this? <laughs> he even has a belt in the middle. That, that is why that is how a lady dress now. Yes. So, so yeah, thank thank you for that. Thank you for that. You, do you see where we get hang up in some things that though they were said, particularly the scripture still stands and it's still good for instruction, but people misunderstand or misuse it based on the time that it was specific to what they were wearing, what they were wearing. It means you shouldn't be dressed the way that the woman is dressed. You should not be changing and, and, and converting exactly what you said right now, which should not be going on. That is the main problem because that pants issue is the main thing that usually stand out the most. Women should not wear pants. Women should not wear pants. Women should not wear pants. If you ask me, there's still a country where men wear skirts and play some instrument. I'm not naming the name, but you know the country I'm talking about. But with a, it, because it's their culture, they wear skirts like and some type of jacket over it. Then it goes to their knees. It's a cultural thing for them. It's not like that's how they dress, but they when they playing the bag uh, bagpipes or whatever, they dress like that. So when we say because of that, they are doing something wrong, no, exactly what you said. The one that says, oh, all the clothes that they have made for men is not good enough for me. I want to dress, dress up in that dress. And you didn't stop there. You now put the wig of the hair you don't have on top of your head. You now do makeup to look like what God has not created you to be, that is an issue. It should not be stuck at, oh, pants or this pants, you can't wear pants. But to me, you are, you are covered up. It should not be a controversy over whether you should wear pants or not. If we all started from this basics, wearing things just like this, that's now considered only for women. So God bless you. Anyone else have a comment? I don't know if anyone typed charts, nothing popped up. So if you have something to add, please feel free to say it. I'll take that as a no. Okay, so um, I talked about the most notable tunic. Uh, we have the one for our Lord Jesus Christ, of course. Um, must have been the latest fashion at the time because we heard they were fighting for it. So um, yeah, and then Joseph's, coat of many color is not actually the overall, it's the tunic. It's, it's the tunic that they gave him. 
uh, and as described, the tunic had long sleeves, which remember we were explaining at the beginning, the ones that have the leisure of having long sleeve are those that are well off. If you don't have money, you get that short sleeve. They just cut the thing off of the sack and cut the V-neck and that's about it for the average person. But those that are well off, they actually have the sleeve. And, and his, his code of medic color having sleeve actually indicated that Joseph was not allowed to conduct any heavy work. He was not even supposed to do. Like we know it, like I, uh, it would say your brothers are in the in the field. Go and give them food. That's not is why is he not in the field? So you know that he was not conducting any heavy work at all. Joseph was chosen heir by God and by his father, which explains why he was the one that received the coat of many color, which traditionally belongs to the firstborn. That's also their custom and manner by giving that. To uh to him, uh, the firstborn were kind of replaced by Joseph because it's the firstborn that's meant to get that coat of many colors. That is their tradition. So the girdle, the girdle, the girdle, the girdle. So that was like a wide, uh, a wide belt, which we saw in Africa where they have the belt there. Um, it's about four to six inches wide, which went around the waist. Without the girdle, that the tunic will you know, would be loose about it and would interfere with a person's ability to work. So it would just really drop down like a free gown. Instead, they have to hold it up and, you know, just tie something. Even as the some of the ones that are shorter for the guy, even though it comes up to the knees, it's kind of like it may be over the knees before you put the girdle and then it just goes a little bit up. Sometimes money was kept in the girdle in a pouch and sometimes the girdle was used to fasten a man's sword to his body as well. So in the biblical language, to be guarded means to be ready for action. So when we're thinking about them tying up the girdle, as we said, is so that they can be ready to work if they need to, especially men, when they have to work, they need to girdle themselves up. Um, it means... Let nothing keep you back or interfere with your progress as you run the race which is set before you. Uh, you need to look at um, Luke uh, 12, 30, uh, 25 and put it here. Uh, be it, see, and then another thing about looking at different versions, you will not understand if you don't look uh, at different versions to know exactly. It's easy to say, be dressed ready for service and keep your lamp burning. Then the King James Version said, let your loins be guarded about and your light burning. So be, be ready, be guarded, be prepared. Don't let anything stop you. Don't let anything stand in your way. So let's add a question here. What do you think uh, this first Peter, someone say something? Okay. Is it just me? I heard someone say hello. Maybe it's just me. Sorry. So, um, yeah, if anyone has something to say, please speak louder or something. What do you think uh, the first part, this uh, first Peter um, 1.13 actually means? Let's discuss that for a moment. He said, therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed in his coming. Now, let's see the different version, right? The, that's the King James Version. Again, he says, wherefore, guard up the loins of your mind. Be sober. Be sober. Let's talk about that for a moment. Is it, we're talking about guarding up and using the, the girdle to guard up and make sure that are ready for action. What is it saying in this case? Wherefore, guard up the loins of your mind. See, let, I, I want someone just to give us an explanation before I say anything. I mean, more like, not like interpreting the scripture, but telling us how us learning the customs and manner here help us to understand the scripture. Because if you can understand the girdle, what it means to guard up your loin, this scripture makes more sense. 
So what do you take from this, this scripture here? What do you think the first part is saying? Anybody? Yes, man of God. I, I think it's saying we have to um, um, take control of our thoughts and to be careful what we our minds are focused on. Amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you. God bless you indeed in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Uh, that, that, is, that is spot on. And, and you see, this comes also from us understanding the benefit of having a girdle. If we don't like, like when you look at it about just thinking of the dress, just having a dress, um, let's just make it realistic too. Sometimes maybe you're going out and you put on a dress. Uh, you think that the dress is missing something and the, the, the something is an accessory. And it's a belt. And the moment you put that belt on, you're like, wow. Like, you just change this outfit that you're wearing. It's kind of the same thing. To guard up the loin of your mind to be ready. Let your mind not be running at a scatter. Guard up the loins of your mind. So knowing the purpose of the girl helps us to understand that scripture a bit better. Praise the Lord. Thank you, woman of God. It is well with you in Jesus' name. Uh, so we have the outer garment as well. The outer garment was called a cloak or a mantle. It was like a large robe. I see a comment here. One moment. Uh, amen. Be be careful and prepare for what is to come. God bless you, woman of God. It is well with you. Um, so it is like a robe. The closest thing we have to it would be an overcoat, like in our day and age. So like right now, if you think of an overcoat, the mantle would shelter the person from the wind and the rain, and it would also serve as a blanket at night. So it's almost like a package. When you That's why I said, for those that have and don't have, when you have that one outfit, the tunic, the, the cloak, you sleep with that. That's the cover. That's what covers you when you go to bed. Whether those people that are uh, like barters or indentured servants, wherever you go to work and you have to sleep out there or whatever the case may be, you it's like you already have your blanket because it's part of, what you wear on a daily basis. Um, this is the outer garment or mantle which Elijah had and which became the property of Elisha himself. Um, as, as we see in the book of 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 8 to 10, he says, Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the, to the right and to the left. And the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me, what can I do for you before I, I am taken from you? He said, let me inherit a double portion of your spirits. Elijah replied, he said, you have asked a difficult thing. Elijah said, yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. So that cloak, the same, the same that is the mantle, is the same cloak. For the average person, the only thing that's missing is this is the anointed man of God. So the cloak is anointed. I'm not, I, I'm not there. I'm, I'm pretty sure maybe the tunic is anointed. Is the one that carried the anointing and is putting on a regular cloak. So his mantle as the cloak that he puts on is the same thing in this case here because it's part of their normal attire. So for us, it will be like when you're done dressing, again, we're referring to us because sometimes we think that we came up with fashion by ourselves. You always have to think there is an origin. Whether they started with sack clothes, V-neck, we still have V-neck t-shirts today. 
We still have V-neck T-shirts today. So we still have V-necks. So whether it was sack clothes or making it from flax, making it from whatever the case that they were using to make it at that time, we receive inspiration from there. Now we started cutting different type of ways to improve as we grow in knowledge, but everything still start from there. If it didn't, we won't have two hand arms cut out on everything we wear. They did that first. We all have necks. They did that. We all have the part that our body comes out of, whether you're wearing a t-shirt, a blouse, your body still goes out through the bottom part. All of that stems from the very basic. Now, we don't wear mantles, but women, you wear shawls. Even men wear shawls. Men put scarf around their neck because they're cold. This was the idea of the cloak, just to put it on them that they will use. Mind you, you know how, if you've ever read a little bit about desert, you will know that it can get as cold as much as it can get as hot in the daytime. It can be hot in the daytime, and then when it's nighttime, it is cold like it's nothing. So that's just desert life. They need to cover themselves. So that cloak serves as something that helped them in that, in that area. Okay. So just a little bit more about the cloak. Um, when people were wealthy enough to afford it or when cold weather made it necessary, a cloak was worn on top of the tunic. So um, the cloaks were uh, made in two forms. In the country where, uh, where once was important, where was important, it was made by wrapping thick woolen material around the body, seaming, seaming it at the shoulders and providing slits for the arms. I'm telling my, my uh, I have this autocorrect thing. It always try to change my stuff and teach me how to speak English. For some people, the cloak was their only form of protection, even if taken in a pledge. You understand that? Sometimes the cloak is given in the pledge if they don't have money. Um, because it is so important, sometimes they have to return it for nightfall so that they can use it to sleep. As you say, uh, whether it's pledged for a full loan, for a loan, it has to be returned to the owner before nightfall for sleeping purposes. So let's see the book of Exodus 22, um, verse 28, verses 28 to 27 say, if you take your neighbor's cloak as a pledge, return it by sunset because that cloak is the only covering your neighbor has. What else can they sleep in? When they cry out to me, I will hear for I am compassionate. So they, it, 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 it is it's the expectation that even if someone came to borrow something from you with their cloak as a collateral, you have to return it for them to sleep. You have to return it for them to speak because there's nothing for them to cover themselves. The other form of cloak was like a loose dressing gown with wide sleeve, uh, which is, I guess, another thing where it's, it, it may have more design. Which you, you can, like, if you look at our books, you see the different types. Like, in, in, like you see the one for the shepherd. You see the, the one for like, I don't know if you guys can see that because I don't see the camera anymore right now, but this is like a, a soldier. Uh, this is just a, a woman and a, a, another working man, not necessarily a shepherd. You see a, a, like a wealthy man here, like someone that's a bit well off. They are the one that start adding colors. You can see colors in there, but the, the regular average people, they're not thinking about colors. Now they feel like you should have black this, red this, blue this, white this. We have this option. In those days, it was just about having clothes to cover yourself. It's not like everybody have the opportunity to have everything that they want. So when made out of silk, it was a luxury garment and that the wealthy person would never think of going out the door without him. Uh, the footwear, uh, believe it or not, some people walk barefoot, especially the poor. And that's just the truth of the moment. 
looking in the, in the book as well. Uh, there is a sample of the footwear here. You can see what they were wearing. Um, I think in many cases, we will not go backwards in Jesus' name, but um, they're reverting back to shoes of the olden days now. And I always almost like, uh, I'm not wearing that. No, I'm not. Um, we don't live in that generation. We live in the generation where they have enough material to make shoes that actually cover your old feet instead of, um, you know, just making something and collecting people's money. The other people are, as well uh, in, in the biblical time was something that resembles sandals. It was mainly sandals. Um, uh, they consisted of a sole made out of wood or leather, which was fastened to uh, the foot by a leather strap. Uh, Peter was told to put on his sandals uh, in the book of Acts 12, 8. You can see also the book of John. Um, and when, when John the Baptist said in Mark 1, uh, 7, because the people wore sandals, their foot got dirty. And, they, and therefore, we read in the Bible about people getting their feet washed. Um, that's also, what I, I think I mentioned that a little bit earlier. That is the custom thing. Um, the feet washing thing uh, is a custom thing. It doesn't say, oh, why would Jesus be washing the feet of his disciples? Well, number one, he is humble. Number two, it's a tradition. It's not just washing their feet for no reason. Before they get into the house, they wash their feet normally because they live in a desert area. They have to get the dirt out. That's just it. Um, they also have hats that they wear. Most men seem to have a, 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 a one, seem to have worn a skull cap. That's, that's what we call it nowadays, but it's still the same, similar to that, that appears to look like a turban. Women, on the other hand, wore a square of material folded to, to make it, to make, a sun shield for their eyes. The hat or headgear for women comes with a light veil that, it, that is over the head so that the woman did not show a face in public place. Um, this way, only the husband may look upon his wife's face. Traditionally, this is, why, this is where wedding ceremonies now produces the idea of lifting the veil over the bride's face. See? That's another custom, the marriage that we inherited from there. So just saying your husband is one that see your face. I mean, that's the part that we took, but it's part of uh, custom and manners of the Bible. Uh, let's see the book of um, Genesis 24, verse 65. It says, for she had said to the servant, who is this man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, it is my master. So she took a veil and covered herself. This was Rebecca, uh, I believe that, yeah, that was her. Um, so in their customs, you don't, men just don't look at you. They always cover their face, especially, you know, if you know in the Middle Eastern, that's like a normal thing that they do. They wear the shawl, they wear the thing. And there are more people that take it even more, 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 more seriously than some people because their old face cover itself is black. You don't even know who you're talking to or who is underneath the covering. There's some people that are like that. So covering of women's heads, uh, respectable women went out with their heads covered and wore veils. That's what was considered uh, their tradition at that time. It was perceived that only persons to displays their faces and showed off their hair in order to attract men. And the Apostle Paul uh, then tells Christian, if a woman in the church will not wear a veil, then she should be shown, but it's best that her head be covered. This is still a controversial discussion to some today. What, what, what is your take on this subject? Um, I'm asking you guys. So I put this there. I have a take. Sure, please. So, so this is Gerardo. No, okay. So I was. I was um I was thinking about what you were talking about this washing of feet. I've been to a church where they wash your feet. So where they got that? So where did that come from? That this this is where this came from, like a culture that they picked up. It's just something that they feel 
they they adopted that in nature that you should be washing the feet washing your feet let let me let me tell you something uh you know we don't talk about churches and stuff like that but you know we don't talk about ministries but if they do it like like all the time maybe it has become a tradition for them because uh, but it's it's not, it's not see it's not a command anywhere no. that you. you have to do it unless holy spirit led them to do i don't know what type of covenant that minister had with god you get what i'm saying oh, okay and i don't know what type of covenant they have with any other being i don't know if you know if they're really serving the lord or not we don't know that but that this is mandated from god as as far as biblical things go it's not a mandate it's based on where they live and what the lord jesus christ did as in terms of humility to mm. his disciples to show that yes he is seen as great but I'm still able to humble myself to do this. So you should be able to do this to your brethren, even when I'm not there. You get what I'm saying? So oh, okay. there is no way that is mandated that we should do it. Mm. But if a church is doing it, maybe you have to be able to ask the minister. No, no, I, I was just to... visiting and I saw it happen. <laughs> like, so I, I'm used to, I've only experienced it in my life one time. Me but too. Holy Spirit let that. Holy Spirit said, do it. No, Holy Spirit okay. said, do it. And it was announced that that moment. It was like Holy Spirit is leading and it just happened. It wasn't like, oh, oh. we plan a foot washing today. No. Oh, it okay. was between a prayer session and it said, Holy Spirit led me to do this. Everybody come here get water and the person doing it got him his feet washed too so it's not like you know i'm just yes. washing everybody's feet you know yeah. there are things that we have to be led by the spirit of god uh -huh. to to know specifically that's why i said i don't know the covenant that man of god had with god maybe say every time someone come in there wash their feet i wasn't there i wasn't there when he got the message we weren't mm -hmm. there you and i weren't there but it is not mandated by God. Okay. And it's specific to their custom because of where they live. Again, when I said, if you've been to Israel, and just go, when you go to Israel, if you go for the first, I haven't been, but I know I've heard stories. Just go, if you want to go and tour the places that our Lord worked and all these major places, mm -hmm. I, I say go and probably wear white shoes so that you can see what it would look like when you're done doing your tour. You may get a sense of why it is good to have your feet washed or just go to Egypt and tell them you wanna go to go on camera rides and stuff like that and see how the dust would be on your on your foot. Then we will understand why they wash their foot. Um, you know, it, it's not normal. Abraham asked to do it. When he saw the angels, he, you know, this is their, their own culture because of where they live. Mm. Yeah, this is their culture specifically. It's part of their hospitality. Um, mm. But sometimes people cling to a particular doctrine and hold on to it and say it's for them particularly. No, no, it was not given to us particularly. That mm. we should do it, do it, do it. Like the things that the Lord want us to do, do this in my remembrance. It was specific. When he said to take communion, he was specific. You know what I'm saying? Right. He was specific to it. Then we know that, that oh, well, the Lord said, do this in my remembrance. So every time I want to remember the Lord, I can drink communion and eat the bread all I want. Choice. You get what I'm saying? But yeah. it's still not a mandate. Like you must do this or you won't make heaven. Nothing like that. And and that would be the same. I would like to hear someone talk about the, the head covering and stuff for the church. What right. Thinking? Well, that 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 is. Yeah. Well, for them, culturally, they did that, you know, and, and, and in this day and age, it is sensitive. It's a sensitive thing that 
uh, people will say, oh, you should do this. But now we have where God say, come as you are. You understand what I'm saying? Uh huh. So that's it, not written nowhere either. About let let me tell you this. The only thing I can tell you about that, the only scripture that just came to my heart is, is the moment the Lord himself came to the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well. You understand what I'm saying? I, yes. Because there is so many things that you must do to even go to a mountain to pray to God at that time in terms of custom and manner. Then the Lord came and said, there comes a time that you will neither worship on that mountain, but in your heart. That mm. is the thing. Some of the people telling people to put a scarf on their head, their heart is not even right with God. Mm. And that person you telling to put the scarf on the head, their heart may be in a better place than God with God than you. That's saying, oh, put that scarf on your head. You know, does God look at the scarf? I'm just saying, don't go to church as well and have purple stream of hair, mm -hmm. pink stream of hair, green mm -hmm. stream of hair, and all braided looking like you're not in church. Like, is that how you want to come to God? You get yeah. what I'm saying? Like, or take the wig off your head. Exactly. Just be presentable. Because when we, I'm just, I'm just being blunt. Yeah, when, I don't read anywhere in the Bible that say when we transform, we're going to be wearing hijab, we're going to wearing covering. We go, mm. no, it mm. is the incorruptible body that will be in the presence of God. So there is no need for any type of covering. Mm. And don't forget also when you're talking about customs and manners, think about the men who the Lord used to write the scripture and their perspective of women at that time. Mm. In these places that we're talking about, even up to now, some of them, the women are not allowed to look at you in the eyes. That again, mm. we look back to the Samaritan woman we're talking about. Customs and manner dictates that she should not be alone by herself to go to that, that well. They go in the packs of women. Mm. So you are not endangered by anybody. You go with a group. But she, because she's been antagonized for her experiences or her past in life, she has to go by herself. But it's against her custom to be there by herself. But no one wants to deal with her. You get what I'm saying? So men have influence some of the things the 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 the, the hum, human author will write based on his or her own perspective but enough to get the point of god across so mm. we we cannot overlook such thing as well so may god help us um that that's my take i i, I think that you can wear your hair nice go to church serve your god with your heart and, and do what you're supposed to do and go home but Come on, don't provoke God himself. Don't put all type of hair that you're sitting in front and you are the one that people are looking at. They can't focus on the ministration anymore because <laughs> your head is so colorful and they, they, they cannot miss it. It's like neon green. I can you overlook neon green and you see right there, my eyes will see it. I will not miss the neon green. Even though I want to focus on the pastor, you have neon green on your head. <laughs> or you have things that are standing up somehow. Whatever it is that you do, if you do that, pack your hair up. We don't need that distraction. Mm. And like, let people not be used of the devil when they come to the presence of God. Yeah, he said, come as you are. If you will not take that hairstyle to your boss, why take it to the presence of God? If you think your boss is not going to like it and you are going to cover it up, why take it to the house of God? Some people know, they know that they cannot dress the way they're dressing in the church in their job, but right. they will do it. They will dress this spaghetti strap. You know you won't wear it to your boss in the office, but you bring it to the church. Should someone need to caution someone about that? When they caution them, they may feel offended because, mm -hmm. again, they're like, God say, come as you are. Yes, but do not tempt God. We have modest we apparel. Right, we have to do what is right because we know it. And that's just the key. We are to do what is right.
because we know it. And, and all the writing is also to help, is to stop someone from tempting other people, saying, okay, you women, cover yourself up, put your cover on your head. I mean, they, again, customs and manners. There's some people that still hold, because you can go in the scripture and say, some people or apostle says the woman should not even stand to teach mm. about God. Do you think God cannot speak to a woman? Do you think a woman cannot be a pastor? Come on now. We are in the days that God is not looking at your gender to pour himself into you. But that was a perspective of man. Man still has perspective. And mm. that influenced their writing. It influenced what they wrote. When, when King David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I don't know where we were studying that. I felt like I, I did a deep study of it. He was only saying that because he knew himself, he was a shepherd. David was a shepherd. To be able to say, the Lord is my shepherd, he was a shepherd. And when he was a shepherd, he was an example of a good shepherd because he took the flocks of his father to, to green pastures. So he was able to use that to illustrate how God dealt with him as a divine shepherd, what he understood. His lifestyle is what he's using to tell a story of God's dealing with him. So whatever this the, 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 the human author have experienced definitely influenced how they wrote or influenced their stance on particular cases. These are things that we may, we, we may want to come to understand. So I hope that helped you. Yes. Praise the Lord. Any more comments? I see a comment in the chat. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Antenna <laughs> and, and, and Gilly. Yeah, there's some people that want you to know that they are there. Like they, like they do it on purpose. And they don't sit in the back. They sit <laughs> in the front. And that thing will be like this. It would just be like, even if you try, you sit down and you try to look at what you're trying to focus on, you can't help but look at their head. Because even the, the thing, it just, you you know those type of gilly, it just goes all like this. Uh, as well, may, may God help us in Jesus' name. That's what we say. Don't come to cause distraction. Rather, just, if you're going to, nobody's stopping you from having your gilly or even to separate. Uh, celebrate just sit yourself in the back where you are the only one sitting there and you're not blocking anybody's view and no one is in that from receiving whether there's a price for trying whether you're making a mistake or not don't be the one that the enemy used to stop someone from receiving what they're supposed to receive no matter the form of distraction we should not be the one doing it so I mean, I, I, honestly, there's so many things. It's just how you feel about being in the presence of God. Like, if you feel like, oh, today, I don't feel like my hair is presentable. I need to cover it because I'm going to the presence of God. If you have to think that way, then you know. If you, you see, this is how we should know how to do the right thing. If you have to question it in your heart. If, you, if you're questioning it in your heart, whatever way then you know that you need to do, you need to, you need to cover your hair up. If you feel some type of way, that's conviction. You need to cover it up because you'd be like, ah, I won't take this to my boss. I know I won't take this to my boss. Even some would know that they will even let their mother or father see that hairstyle, but they, they will take it to church. So it is well in Jesus name. Any other comments in that area? And we have a few more slides. Yeah, okay. So, so of course they have ornaments. Ornaments, in addition to clothes that were heavy, personal ornamentation by makeup, ornaments and hair treatments. You didn't start, you didn't start up the trend of doing hair and makeups and all that. They had it, okay, they, they had it. This was very important to women, even in the New Testament, so much more that Christians were warned to ornament themselves with the meek and quiet spirit, not 
just make up and all that. Again, we don't want to go into that, but that's another controversy. There's a particular who that say you shouldn't wear makeup and stuff. Um, there's some beliefs like that. So first Peter chapter three, verse three to four, say, do not let, let your adornment be merely outward. So you see, if you read this clearly, if you're reading it like I'm reading it, um, you already see that it's not saying don't wear it. Right? Is, did anybody see that, or is it just me? It's not saying don't do um, ornaments. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the incorruptible beauty of a a gentle and quiet spirit which is very precious in the sight of God. So it's not saying do not, it's not saying don't do it. Say, do not let your adornment be merely outward. Don't just let it be outside. That's all what I gather from there. Uh-huh. Merely, merely. Do not let it be merely outward. That is the key. So when, when, you, when, you, when you, you do what you do, make sure the heart is clean. That's it. That's it. So many people blame people for wearing this, wearing that, wearing that. Where is the heart of that person? Like I, I have so many people that judge people that, that already made a mistake and got tattooed before they gave their life to Christ. And I'm like, well, me, I don't judge people because there's a thin line between judging people. Like try to criticize or judge. I don't do judgment. God already warned us, judge not or you will be judged. I don't, uh-uh. The revelation I have with God when he's saying something to me a while ago about judgment, judging people, that if men judge without applying mercy, when God judges, he applies mercy. But if you do not apply mercy when you're judging your brethren, he will not apply mercy when he judges you too. I don't want to be judged by God, though. I do not. Um, not, not <laughs> in the final judgment, may have, may, may be in this present that he say, hey, welcome home my servants. That's all I want. I don't want to judge other people. Everybody has to answer to God. That's, uh-uh. I don't, I don't have to. Let's see the detail of the ornament as described by Isaiah. So Isaiah 3, 18 to 20, it said, in that day, the Lord would take away the finery, the jingling, the jingling anklets, the scarves, excuse me, the crescents, the pendants, the bracelets, the veils, the head dresses, the long ornaments, and the headbands, the perfume boxes, the charms, and the rings, the nose juries, they wore all these things because it's part of their culture, it's part of their tradition. It necessarily make them bad. All those that you know, uh, the Abrahams and all those things that we, we read in the scripture, this is their cultural thing. They've done. They've done it. Jewelry. You even know in the in, in in some part of the scripture, if you read before, when they they melted all their jewelry to make themselves a calf. They've been doing. They've been having jewelry. They've been having jewelry. It's not. It's not new at all. It's not new. So this is just general. We've kind of like talked about this. Uh, the garment is mainly similar, but sometimes in length. Um, between men and women. So the women's own is mostly longer, but men sometimes, especially the, the rich one, can have the longer one. The average person just wants one that's up below their knee a little bit. Once they have the, the cloak and the guard or everything that goes with it, um, the women have the veil that covers it, of course. Um, uh so cleaning the clothes clothes were clean uh by allowing the swift current of stream to pass through them to wash the dirt out and away soap were made of either olive olive oil or from vegetable alkali as the author noted the psalmist used an example of washing clothes to show our need for cleansing from our sins psalms 51 2 said, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. That's the same thing that they try to do when they let the stream run through the clothes. Um, the priest clothing, uh, the priest usually wore linen 
um, garments over the top of the tunic to help keep it clean. This garment is usually referred to as an ephod. If you remember the case of uh, uh, David, uh, King David, when he actually has effort to, to actually pray, because, you know, of course, is the priest of his own house. First uh, Samuel 2, verse 18 to 19 says, But Samuel ministered before the Lord, even as a child, wearing a linen effort. Moreover, his mother used to make him a little robe and bring it to him year by year when she produced her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Though the high priest wore special clothes, he still followed the basic provision, kind of like whatever they have. They have a tunic, but theirs may just look a little bit special because of embroidery. Um, their tunic was blue. The effort was richly embroidery and carried a jewelry encrusted pouch containing two locks from which uh, the will of God might be ascertained. So we talk about lot casting. So uh, I just went a little bit into that. So I think that's where we rounded up. Yeah, lot casting is where we rounded up. So uh, the practice of casting lot is mentioned 70 times in the Old Testament, seven times in the New Testament. In spite of the many references to casting lots in the Old Testament, nothing is known about the actual lots themselves. They could have been sticks of various lengths, flat stones like coins, or some kind of dies. But the exact nature is unknown, so they use different things. The closest thing for us right now when we think about casting lot is flipping up a coin. Like when you flip up a coin, it's kind of like the same thing. The practice of uh, casting lot occurs most often in connection with the division of land under Joshua. So a procedure that God instructed the Israelite on several times in the book of Numbers. So if you want to uh, read up on it, we have the scripture reference for you. Um, God allowed that the, God allowed the Israelite to cast lots in order to determine his will for a given situation. Various offices and functions in the temple were also determined by lots. Um, the sailors, if you remember, on, on Jonah's ship, uh, they also cast lot to determine who brought God's wrath upon their ship. Remember, and they say, it is this one because he's still sleeping. The 11 apostles cast lot to determine who would replace Judas. Casting lot eventually became like a game um, that people played uh, made, uh, and made wagers on. Like, for example, the Roman soldiers, they cast lot on Jesus's garment. It was like a game they played. The New Testament um, in, in nowhere instruct Christians to use a method similar to casting lots to help with decision making. We are not supposed to cast lots. Um, like uh, this, there's an example that I will give. This is not, I, how can I say this? Um, this is like real life thing that I witnessed when I was in school back home in Nigeria. The, uh, there was someone that stole something in our classroom. We were still in what you call secondary school back then. I don't remember the exact class I was in, but someone stole something. And there is this guy, he's Muslim, he's Muslim. But he's the one that they used to find who stole something, wherever it is. If someone stole something, instead of, I guess, properly investigating, this particular day, we were all in class and someone stole something, was missing, reported it to the teacher, and they didn't let any of us go. They called this guy from wherever. It was more like a senior in the school to us. So he's a Muslim, as I said. So he took a Bible. This is some funny way of doing some, because you can, I, 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 it's, it's casting lots, but I'm telling you, I, I, I don't understand the process. But, um, and he put a key in the middle of the Bible, let's say the size of the normal King James, uh, the New Testament Bible that people actually hand out the pocket size. And he put a key in the middle, like those olden days keys, like not the one that we have now that's really flat. The ones that are really thick and has this edge and then he's, you, you know what I'm saying? And it's, it's like thin in the middle. And then the shape is like different at the top. He put that in there and then he wrapped 
rubber band around it to hold the key in the middle. And he and someone else was holding the key like on the top. So the Bible is like just attached to it and leaning down. And it will call each individual one at a time. And it will say some type of what I will call, what is this word? What is the word I'm looking for? Uh, anyway, it will recite something. There's a word for it. Some type of sayings like that they pronounce. Some type of saying, whatever the saying. Like you want to say demonic chanting. Yeah, like a chanting. Like he would do some type of chanting like chanting, he would just say some things. And he's using the Bible. He's a Muslim. He would say some chanting. And then he would say, then he would mention the person's name. And they say, if this is the person that stole this, he would tell the key to turn. Like turn, turn. It's not someone told me. I was there. I went, they did it, they did mine. Then he got to the person that actually stole the thing before he brought it out. He says, if this guy stole this, turn, turn. The, the key flipped. Mind you, they're both holding the edge of it with their finger like this. So if it turned around and the Bible fell into the middle, like in between, between their fingers, because the key turned sideways instead of laying on their fingertips. And then I was like, okay, but that's the closest that I've been to seeing what you call like casting lots try to pick who did what, who did this. That was my witness. But in this day and age, now that we're living, we have the word of God and the Holy Spirit to guide us. We don't need a game of chance. Oh, is it this one or this one? Is this the will of God or not? Unless if you're doing that, you're taking a free ride in your own life because the Bible says, or not just say the Bible. The Lord says, my sheep knows my voice. So we don't need any other thing. The shepherd leaves his, his flock. That's it. The word of God, the spirit, and, the, and, and prayer are sufficient for discerning God's will today. Not casting lots, rolling dice, or flipping a coin. We don't need to do that anymore. Ritual. Yes. It's some, it's, it, yeah, it is, it is, it is ritual. You know, at that time, I was confused because, I mean, this time we're talking, I was still a Muslim, a young Muslim boy. I, I, would, I, I was a Muslim, yes. But it was like, your grandma is Muslim and your grandfather is Christian. So you went to church on Sunday. You went to uh, Islam school every day after school to go and learn the Quran. That was it. We went to church every Sunday. We also went to the mosque and, and prayed and, and we did the fasting. We were, we were just doing the both worlds at the time. So I was shocked that this Muslim brother would take the Bible as a way, because he knows about casting the lot. And they, they do it too. They know how to use the things of the, uh, of the scripture to, uh, to help determine stuff. So this mode of determining a matter was ordered of God to be practiced over two goats on the day of atonement. This was an example um, that uh, if, if you want to read it in, in the book of Leviticus here, just, it, I suggest reading, I just didn't want to put them all on the slides. Um, when they have two goats and to decide which one exactly of the goat is for atonement or for sacrificing to the Lord. And by casting lot, they're able to determine which one. God also commanded the land should be divided by lot casting. This is how they divided the lot, the lots, the land. The people restored, uh, resorted to it for various purposes on the return from exile. Uh, God overruled among his people uh, how the lot shall fall, as stated in Proverbs. He says, the lot is cast into the, into the lap but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. So whatever it is, uh, even though they cast the law, that's the based of human, human way of doing things and how God gave them the instruction, but they continue to use it. Now, even some people probably still do it, you know, even to this point right here. But that, that is 
uh, basically the gist of lot casting. I just didn't want to brush over it without, you know, saying anything. But as you know, like part of the priest outfit, there's a, uh, two lots that is attached to it. So that, you know, the priest back there would be able to cast lots to, to, to figure out the will of God at a particular time. So this is where we stop uh, for today. Um, you know, again, like I said, our readings will be um, discussed here. Uh, you can start reading Dwelling. Um, again, I, I have calculated this book. We have about 18 actual chapters to read, um, but they're not long. And I think our class is also 14 weeks, so we may have to combine a couple of them. But for now, we will take them one at a time so we can get into detail of each. Um, so you want to read, <coughs> excuse me, chapter two. Um, that is titled Dwelling for our next class. Chapter two, that is titled Dwelling, 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 Dwelling. Okay. Any questions at this point? No questions? Okay. Oh, you guys are quiet today. Thank you, Sister Desiree, for actually talking. And uh, I know some people are uh, out there working and things like that, so we understand. Um, it, it's much fun when you know we can all chime in, because this 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 course is kind of like really interactive. And because if we get a better understanding of uh, this custom and manners, it will help us uh, understand some some of the scriptures very better. And every time there's a reference to a scripture as to what custom and manners um, influence that scripture, we are going to discuss it. So please be prepared to, to discuss with us. Uh, thank you. Uh, if you don't know, this is, if not my favorite class, is this one of them? Just because like learning about their customs, it, it, it just, it clarifies a lot of things. And, you know, and like, for example, if we, we would get, I believe it's still in this book. Like, if you remember the story of uh, a man coming to ask his friend for bread at nighttime, you would think that that friend was not, was just not trying to help. But when you learn about the way their buildings are, which is the next one, we should be talking about that next. When you learn about the way, the structure of their buildings, you will learn that if that man was to get up, he will wake up his whole family. And which is why he was telling him like, oh, it's not like he didn't want to do it. It's not that, but the way they sleep in, their, in the house that that man have, he wake up everybody just to get to that door and give him what he wants. So it, it just helps us to understand better. It, it would have been an inconvenience. So thank God for today. And I'm glad that you guys were able to join. Um, I look forward to seeing you guys next week by God's grace. As you read, even if any question comes, um, please, uh, where is testing of law in chapter one? It is not in the book. It's only in the, uh, when you look at the part that talks about the priest's, uh, priest uh, dress, the priest's clothing, you will see that it talks about cast the two lots is there. Now, that is why I didn't want to brush off, as I explained earlier, I didn't want to brush off just leaving lot and not talk about the use of casting lot. So I did my research myself and added that there. So, but if you read here, I think you can still see, it talks about the priest's uh, right here, own outfit. It, it mentioned... Um, Two lots is attached to the priest's outfit. Um, then I decided to just talk about the use of casting of lot as a way of them to decipher the will of God. Yes, ma'am. God bless you. God bless you so much. So um, God bless everyone. It was great to have you with us today and look forward to next week by God's grace. It is well with you all in the name of Jesus Christ. God bless Bye now. God bless. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome.